Greetings. I've decided to do another review of Thomas Pynchon's novel Gravity's Rainbow whilst wearing an elastic band on my face because why the hell not? In case you're unfamiliar, but if you're watching this sort of channel you're probably not, Thomas Pynchon is an American author who enjoys hiding from the public and writing a lot of very pretentious books which are, despite themselves, very enjoyable. This is the third one I've read, so I must like him. In fact, I do. I will admit that now. Although, a warning, his first two books don't quite prepare you for this. V, his first novel, is a fairly conventional narrative in the most part. It jumps a lot between present and past. Well, by present, it's the 1950s, but it was written around that time, so just accept it. That is what happens when you read books, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, tangent over. Um... Half of the book focuses on the Bohemians of 1950s art world and the other half jumps around various time periods chasing a mysterious figure called V who turns out to be a woman called Victoria who goes through a strange transformation over the course of her life and who knew one of the characters' father. Stencil as the character looking for her and his father was acquainted with Victoria, although strangely not very frequently. A lot of other characters are more frequently acquainted with her. His second novel, The Crying of Lot 49, is a little bit more strange than V, but it's very short and the story is quite linear, so it's very easy to process, even though there's a, there's a band called The Paranoids, which is basically The Beatles, but weird who suddenly randomly break out into song every few chapters, and also the symbols of paranoia are everywhere, literally everywhere. And a hobo burns himself on his bed for some strange reason, so that's nice. But nothing that happens in those two novels really compares to this novel here. Set in the closing years of World War Two and the year afterwards. The novel's focus is mainly on the V2 rocket, which is somehow a metaphor for humankind's love, sexual love, with its own destruction. Ha ha ha. Scenes from the book include men throwing pies at planes, old elderly brigadiers eating shit for sexual pleasure, which is why it didn't win the Pulitzer Prize, and someone living inside their own penis for some reason. Oh, and also a sentient light bulb who plans a revolution against the electronic company who made him. And his name's Byron. Although I think, I have to say, the main positive thing about this book is a lot of its reputation for difficulty is not quite as founded as you would think. The main difference between this and other difficult novels like, say, Ulysses, for example, is that while Ulysses is an actual effort to read. You really have to wade through those passages of strange styles. Gravity's Rainbow tricks you into finding it easy because the language and the way it's written flow so well and so aesthetically pleasing the whole way through. That it take, You can read like five pages before you actually realise, hang on a minute, I have no clue what the fuck he's going on about. It lulls you into a full sense of security. And which means I probably didn't understand as much of it as I should have done. But it was a much more enjoyable read than something like Ulysses, which is fairly simple in concept, but it makes no secret of how difficult it is. That being said, I think I got the general gist of most of the story. And considering this is apparently like the second most difficult novel ever written after Finnegan's Wake, it's a fairly good, like, at, at least 80% I would say I understood, and that's probably quite good going for a novel that highly ranked in the scales of difficulty. Once we've got that bit out of the way, I will talk about what I liked about this book, and I did like an awful lot of it. As I've already said, Pynchon's style is very enjoyable to read. He excels at a sort of orgasmic build of different words all converging into a concept, that's his style. And other writers do it occasionally, but Pynchon does it all the time, and he's better than anyone at it. 
anything could be a metaphor for anything else. And I'm sure the V2 rocket has been a metaphor for more than just a penis throughout the book. It's been a metaphor for pretty much everything. The one problem with this style is he perhaps does it a bit too frequently. And even though I'm the sort of person who would much rather read a book full of incredibly lyrical, pretentious passages with loads of metaphors for concepts than pared down language and characterization, even I think it's a little bit too much at some points. It sort of loses its impact after a while. It's it's sort of like eating a bag of sweets very quickly. You sort of want something a bit savoury after all that sweetness. Because really lyrical passages in novels are quite sweet, if you know what I mean. And I felt like I was wading through treacle a lot of the time in that book. I just wanted something savoury and cold, like, I don't know, Jick Dickens or Kafka or something like that, something more minimalist. And the other problem with the style is I think there's a lot of the time where you can't quite tell where the line is between incredible invention and batshit craziness. I think he may actually be literally fucking insane. And this is very interesting to read a lot of the time, but sometimes it's just like, really? That being said, he does make some amazing suggestions in this book that you know aren't really true, but they're sort of stretching paranoia to its limits. Like in one scene, he suggests that we can actually hear the roar of the sun and that sound can in fact travel through space and it's all a lie that it can't. But we've been trained to tune it out. Obviously that's bullshit, but it's still in a really intriguing concept. Although coming to the bullshit part, Thomas Pynchon reminds me a bit of Morrissey in that respect. Like, you can't quite tell with it when he's self-satirising or not, or just satirising in general, because sometimes you feel like the stuff is so pretentious that he's actually taking the piss out of other writers in the same genre as him. And sometimes you think he's probably not, and that's just how he writes. And the two are so similar that... You can't quite tell. The way I say it's like Morrissey is that sometimes Morrissey has lines like, I was lying in my bed. I think about life and I think about death. And neither one particularly appeals to me. That kind of thing. It's so melodramatic and depressing and like, oh, I'm Morrissey. And, but he's obviously got a sense of humour and you can tell that sometimes he's actually taking the piss out of himself even though he's incredibly egotistical. And it's like that with Thomas Pynchon, but instead of being melodramatic and Morrissey-like, he's pretentious and paranoid. But the actual bits where he's being himself and when he's self-satirising are so similar, you can't tell the difference. But these are all minor flaws, and really they sort of add in to the whole way of writing that Thomas Pynchon has, and they wouldn't really, it wouldn't really work without them. So that's they're not the real reason that I'm not elevating this book to among my favourites because I think it's an incredibly insightful book and it's, it's almost drug-like as well. There's so many things happening. It's, Give me more. Don't say crack, Jez. Not now, because when you say crack, it makes you think of crack. And I love crack. So can you not say crack? The main flaw is how artificial, how cold it, the book is. And I just can't feel anything towards it other than a sense of momentary enjoyment. It's sort of like masturbating in a way. It's a weird analogy I know for something that's revered and so, by so many literary critics. But it's almost like the literary world's equivalent of trash fiction. It's incredibly intellectual and there's so many concepts and it delves deep into human fears but really when it boils down to it it's quite a shallow book it's all aesthetics it's not really human and I know it's not supposed to be and I tried to get past it when I was reading it but you need you need sort of more connection and 
it's perfectly capable because there are a few very poignant scenes in the book. They are quite few and far between, but they they do exist. Like there's a scene where a character called Pirate Prentice gets led into a room full of various assassins and criminals, and he realizes he'll never escape the world of the world of they, the paranoids of they, and they will always have his soul, and he'll always be one of them but a lower one of them who doesn't have any power, obviously. And he just wants to be good, but he can't escape. And that was a really, really poignant scene, the way it was written. It may not sound so when I'm describing it, but it was. And if there was maybe a few more scenes like that in the book, I would give it an A grade, because that doesn't actually affect the quality that much. It just means... it stops it from quite reaching the level beyond because really he could have kept the sort of uber intellectual uber lyrical sort of madhouse of the book and add a few more sort of more poignant scenes and well-developed characters but he just chose not to because i don't know really why it's not even like i'm saying the whole book should have been like that just a few more scenes like the one I've just described, and it would be perfect. But unfortunately, it only gets a B. If I was American, it'd definitely be a B plus, but unfortunately, I'm not American. That's not unfortunate. Don't remember that I said that, because I didn't mean it. No offence to the Americans. Um, but unfortunately, I can't use the American grading system, because B plus would be perfect. But I'm going to give it a B, because that is the most apt grade. And now... Finish a review, I can take this elastic band off and I'll probably have a mark on my face. I have to explain to people by saying I decided to wear an elastic band on my face while reviewing a book in order to be eccentric. That's not a very good excuse, is it? Okay. Thank you. Bye.